Picture, if you will, an apple. It's red or green, it's crunchy and juicy, it's a very nice apple. And that apple has a market value. Now, picture a change in the world that results in everyone deciding that apples should be free. In that scenario, what happens to the people who plant and grow and harvest the apples? They still have a product, but they can't get paid in the way they used to. Now picture that that apple is in demand everywhere. Every time you turn on your TV and see a commercial, there's that apple. When you download an app for your phone, there's that apple. In the movies, in video games, in restaurants, there's that apple. In 2014, the music business is kind of like this. Everyone wants to use music because music sets moods. It creates emotions. It makes people want to dance. In other words, it has value. Yet the marketplace says it's free. This is the dilemma that people who make music find themselves in today. It still costs the same to record and press and promote an album, yet we can't sell this product like we used to. So those of us who produce the music, the artists and labels, have to wonder how long we can keep this up. Is there a future in music, or what? Can I have a taste of your ice cream? Can I lift the crumbs from your table? Can I interfere in your crisis? No, mind your own business. No, mind your own business. I'm Portia Sabin, host of The Future of What, and I run the independent record label Kill Rock Stars. I've seen a lot of changes in how money moves in the music business in the last 10 years. In this hour, we want to get a clearer picture of what these changes look like for the people who matter most, the musicians. Without musicians, music won't get made. But the number of people who can make a living from their music has dropped radically in recent years. To kick off this discussion, we've invited an actual career musician to talk about how the flow of his money has changed. Hutch Harris started the band The Thermals in 2002 and has put out six albums. Hutch, welcome to the future of what? Thanks, Portia. So when you started the band, what uh, were your main sources of income, like at the very beginning when you guys put out your first record? So we all had day jobs. I was actually working at Stumptown uh, Coffee Roasters in Portland. So I worked there from, I think, like 2000 to 2006. Great. And then so in 2006, you were able to quit your day job? Yeah, we... Uh, I think uh, we had just released like our third record, "The Body of the Blood of the Machine," and that had like at that point, that had like that record had done better than anything else we did, and uh, we had almost like got too busy to have day jobs, but we also had enough income at that point. Cool. And so your income was from record royalties. It was from royalties, um, touring, and licensing. Right. So those were the three big income streams yeah. sort of in 2006. Yeah. But in the last, what is that, eight years, how has your income changed? It's still, it's like the percentages are pretty much the same. It's still, most of the money comes from touring, um, licensing still, and then, of course, less record royalties just because people aren't buying records as much. Right. As we all know. Yeah. Sadly. Um Taylor Swift has brought Spotify into the spotlight in the last few weeks. So do you have a sense of how the thermals are doing from streaming royalties and Spotify in particular? Um, I know we get a ton of plays on Spotify, but, you know, 100,000 plays on Spotify equals like seven cents or something. <laughs> so, yeah, right. there's that. So you don't have a sense of actually like what percentage of your income at this point? Is coming yeah, from you streaming. know, we get statements. Yeah, I, I don't look close. You know, I look at the totals of streaming, and there's so many different sources, so I'm not paying attention exactly to how much is coming from each source, you know, so I don't know exactly how much we're making from Spotify, but I know it's not a lot. <laughs> right. So basically what, um, what has happened, though, in the past 12 years is that you have started to see money from different income streams come in although it's not really making up for the lost record royalties. Uh, yeah, and it's so, uh, I mean, it's it's different each year for us. It just depends, you know, one year you can have, uh, you can do a lot of placements, you know, you can uh, license songs to, you know, TV and film, and, you know, the next year that won't happen. So it's just, uh, you know, something that's constantly changing. Right, yeah, that's so true. So, um do you know anything about your royalties from internet radio play like Pandora? Have you seen much of that? It's on the same statement. Uh, you know, our, our publisher, Terrorbird, sends us a statement uh, twice, uh, you know, twice a year. And there'll be all kinds of sources um, 
you know, Tony Keel from Sub Pop, he put it best to me. He said the future uh, is all about adding parts of pennies. <laughs> Together. I mean, you know, that's not exactly what he said, but really, you know, you're looking at like thousands of plays on thousands or on, on a ton of different sources. Uh, but, you know, each play is earning a very small amount of money. Right. That's true. Um, one of the other sources that artists are getting paid by nowadays is um, sound exchange. And have you noticed your sound exchange royalties increasing over time? Yeah, we've done really well. Uh, like we're constant, you know. We I think we get paid four times a year from Sound Exchange. I still don't know what exactly we're getting paid for. When well, that is actually comes. the Internet Radio Play, like Pandora. Oh, okay, that it's collected by Sound Exchange, and cool. then they pay you directly. Yeah, I love Sound Exchange because they just send a check. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah, I it's know. great. Yeah, it's very very handy. And there's lots of artists who haven't signed up with Sound Exchange yet. Yeah, I feel like when we were on Kill Rockstars, I think it was you guys who said, you know, you should really get on Sound Exchange because <laughs> they have all this money waiting for you. It's, you know, it's weird because you'll get emails, uh, you know, that, you know, sound like it's from like a Nigerian prince or something. It says, like, you know, we have this money, you just have to sign up. And a lot, of, you know, they seem so bogus. And so Sound Exchange, I think we had probably like heard from them before. We just didn't know that it was a real thing. We finally signed up and, you know, they sent us a huge check because it, it was years <laughs> of royalties adding up. Don't you think? I, I mean, I think that's really common. I think that everybody thinks it's the Nigerian press. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's just so much, you know, uh, there's so many people trying to scam you on the internet yeah. that you're like, uh, you know, you don't want to sign up for anything because you don't know, you yeah. know what they're trying to do to you. Totally. Um, so looking back, when you were a kid, what did you think being a career musician would look like? Guns and Roses. <laughs> I, You know, when I... Okay, I'm almost 40 years old. So when I was, uh, you know, I was in high school, you know, the big bands, you know, before Nirvana, Nevermind came out when I was like 16 years old, you know, so I had like the, it was it was perfect. But before that, you know, I was listening to, you know, Guns N' Roses. I was listening to like classic rock and then butt rock, like from the 80s and early 90s. Um, I didn't know, you know, I mean, obviously in the 90s or late 80s, like indie rock was really starting to be like something, you know, it was becoming like as real as like what was on the majors but you know when I was like middle school and like you know early high school like all I knew about being in a band is that you know you put on makeup and leather jackets <laughs> and made millions of dollars <laughs> so you know what you know which was never gonna be my life <laughs> um when you uh meet kids today who are in new bands uh do they seem to know what they're getting into? Like, do you think that they have ec realistic expectations of how they're going to make money? No, but you, <laughs> uh, you you need to be kind of delusional to think that you would ever be <laughs> successful in entertainment, you know, in any uh, area of entertainment. I think what's weird is that kids now are, like, really savvy about promotion and, you know, social networking and, like, being on the Internet. But... Uh, they're focusing less on like actually being good at what they do. So anytime, you know, bands will always or, you know, sometimes ask me for advice. And my advice is usually, you know, focus on actually being a good band first and then worry about the business because they, you know, they kind of start sometimes by focusing on the business and it's not going to work if your band's no good. Hutch Harris of the Thermals is talking about his money here on The Future of What?, we're going to hear more from Hutch later in the show. We turn now to an issue currently unfolding concerning digital performance royalties. As Hutch just mentioned, there are a lot of new income streams for artists now. The nonprofit organization Sound Exchange is mandated to collect digital performance royalties for labels and artists for internet radio play. However, songs written prior to 1972 are not covered by U.S. copyright law and thus have historically been ineligible for digital performance royalties. In mid-November, a federal judge in Manhattan ruled that the satellite radio company Sirius XM had to pay Flo and Eddie of the band The Turtles royalties for playing their pre-1972 music. That came after a similar ruling in California and is the third such ruling in the past three months. Emily Green is a journalist with The Daily Journal, a California legal paper, and she joins us to discuss this issue. Emily, thanks for joining us on The Future of What? Thanks so much for having me. So can you give us an overview of this latest case? 
Yeah, so the basic gist of it is that Flo and Eddie from the group The Turtles are embarking on this groundbreaking lawsuits and they're winning. And what they're saying is that they are entitled to royalties uh, on recordings that they made before 1972. And they say, well, yes, we are not entitled to royalties uh, under federal law, but under state law. They say we are entitled to royalties. So federal copyright law doesn't cover pre-1972 recordings, but each state has a different statute. That's right. Each state has a different statute, and that's what makes it a little complicated. So right now they've they've filed lawsuits in California. They won, and that was sort of the first of it. And I think that the thought is maybe that's going to lead to a, a groundswell of, of other lawsuits and potentially other victories. And, and that's where we are right now. They've also filed a class action in New York, Florida, and California seeking $100 million from Sirius. Do you think that the state wins uh, suggest that there might be a change in the federal law at some point? I think that it could very likely lead to a change in the federal law. Uh, Earlier this year in May, a bill was introduced in Congress. It's called the RESPECT Act, and it would establish performance royalties for all recordings made uh, before 1972. The bill is supported by uh, some big-name people, including the Allman Brothers, Al Green and Roseanne Cash, who is, of course, the daughter of Johnny Cash. Uh, We have to see what's going to happen to that bill. It's pending currently. So Sirius XM paid out $342 million last year in royalties, according to the New York Times. What might they have to pay out in settlements if other pre-1972 artists follow Flo and Eddie's lead? You know, I, I think that's a big unknown. Right now, Flo and Eddie are asking for a lot of money. As I mentioned, they are suing for $100 million against Sirius. They've also filed a lawsuit seeking $25 million in California alone against Pandora. What it might mean for other artists, I don't know. I can only imagine that we are going to uh, see similar lawsuits seeking similarly huge amounts of money. Um, I think this question also speaks to your earlier question about what it could mean for a change in federal law. As we see potentially more of these lawsuits filed and and we see groups like the Turtles racking up victories, it's definitely going to put some incentive for Congress to pass legislation. And it's also going to put some incentive on the industry and groups like Sirius and Pandora and the National Association of Broadcasters to support legislation so that they're not having to continuously deal with lawsuits being filed against them. That's legal journalist Emily Green joining us from San Francisco as we talk about how artists make money here on the future of what. While digital performance royalties were created by two separate acts of Congress in 1995 and 1998, there is still no royalty for terrestrial radio play, meaning artists and labels are not compensated for their music being played on regular radio stations. Daryl Friedman is the head of advocacy for the Recording Academy, a group that represents artists, producers, and engineers throughout the U.S. They are best known for awarding the Grammys every year. Daryl, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Portia, to be with you. So the United States is one of only a handful of countries in the world that does not pay performance royalties for terrestrial radio play. And some of the other countries that don't are North Korea, Iran, and China, correct? We're in great company, aren't we? (laughs) Do you think that that has any resonance for people, that, uh, that particular list? Well, certainly it does, because the United States wants to be a champion of intellectual property. And we go around the world telling other countries like China that they should respect our intellectual property. How much more powerful would that be if we did the same and we respected our own IP by providing this compensation to the deserving creators? So can you tell us a little bit of the history of the chase for a terrestrial performance right in Congress. I'm glad you asked about the history specifically because I know we've talked and you spoke with Hutch earlier about you know all the more recent changes in the um, in the music space. This is not a new issue though. This has nothing to do with the recent change to a digital economy. Bing Crosby was talking about this issue. Frank Sinatra was talking about this issue to get his band paid. This has been an issue since the beginning of radio that artists have felt that their work deserves compensation uh, when it's played on radio. What's happened, though, in the new digital space is the fact that Internet radio is paying and satellite radio is paying. It's shown a bright spotlight on the issue and, and to say, why, why are these new, these new technologies should be paying? But why is the oldest and richest technology for distributing music that we have, broadcast radio, 
and I'm talking about corporate radio here, commercial radio primarily, why are they allowed to get a free ride and not pay the performers? So in 2008, a number of artists got together and organized the Music First Coalition, and now we have a very strong lobby in Washington working on this issue with hearings that are trending very well for us and for artists, and we think this issue will be resolved positively in the coming years. Now, what Emily Green mentioned about the RESPECT Act, can you catch us up a little bit on your experience with that? Yeah, the RESPECT Act is a a very important piece of this puzzle because the digital services are currently paying royalties on post-72 recordings. They should be paying on all recordings. There's no expiration date on on the value of this music. Um, So that's a very important piece of this. But of course, terrestrial radio isn't paying on pre-72 or post-72. So we need to have one holistic approach to make sure that all artists are compensated fairly for their work no matter what decade they worked in. Now, I understand that there was a press release by Sirius mentioning that they are now pushing for a terrestrial radio royalty. Have you heard that? I haven't heard that, but I think they've been, um, both Sirius and Pandora have uh, justifiably stated that broadcast radio, corporate radio, should be paying a performance royalty because that's a very unlevel playing field. So let's just talk about post-72 for a second. Sirius is paying royalties. Pandora is paying royalties. Their competitor, corporate radio, is not paying royalties. So they should be with us on this issue, and they should we should all be supporting the fact that all artists should be paid compensated for all performances on all types of platforms. Another issue that I thought was very interesting about the performance royalty that we don't have in this country is that because we don't pay a performance royalty, other countries won't give us reciprocity. So we can't get the money that they're holding for us in other countries. That's absolutely correct. And that's, that's one of the great shames of this, of this really scandalous uh, uh, issue in our law. If an American artist, if Hutch's music is played, and I'm sure it is because American music is loved all over the world. So when Hutch's records are played in Japan or France or Germany, that royalty is not being passed on to Hutch. We're losing 70 to $100 million at least a year to our, on our shores from this income that should be coming to American artists. And how much of that is mine? <laughs> <laughs> About $1 million. <laughs> Yeah, we got to find a way to get Hutch that money. Now, is North Korea, do they even play music there? (laughs) (laughs) Guys, I want to talk now more about royalties, so I'm going to bring in Michael Huppy, the president of Sound Exchange. Michael joins us from his office in Washington, D.C. Mike, welcome to the future of what? Hi, Portia. Always happy to be here and talk to you. Oh, great to hear from you. So can you please give us a brief overview of what Sound Exchange does for those people who aren't familiar? Sure. So Sound Exchange is a nonprofit here in D.C. that basically represents and enables um, a lot of the digital radio space and services that we all know and love. Uh, so when you think about services like Pandora, Sirius XM, iHeartRadio, et cetera, we represent all of the recording artists and all of the record labels uh, with those services, making sure that they are properly compensated when they're art is used to fuel these services. Um, So those services pay us royalties for the use of the recordings, and then every month we pay it out to artists and labels. We have over 100,000 accounts uh, that we represent in the industry trying to make this money from the digital uh, economy flow to the people who made the great art that, that is the basis of all of it. Sound Exchange has collected about $2 billion for artists since the organization was founded 10 years ago. Can you explain how this money is distributed? Sure, and it's actually uh, well over $2 billion at this point. Um, you know, as, as the digital radio platforms explode, it is a place where a lot of people go to get their music. And when money passes through sound exchange, it is split 50-50 between the owner of the sound recording copyright, typically a record label, but 50% of every dollar we get goes straight and directly to the artists, and, and a portion of that even goes to a fund that pays uh, background musicians and background vocalists as well, uh, people who, who contribute to a recording and, and often until now have not participated in a lot of the downstream stream income. But basically it's split 50-50 between the artists and the owner of the, of the copyright. Mike, at the beginning of the show we were talking to Hutch Harris from the Thermals. He's still here, so we can still talk to him. But he heard, hello, mentioned, Hutch. Hey, Mike. <laughs> he mentioned that, um, you know, sometimes you get an email and it sounds like it's from a Nigerian prince. And it's, uh, it's, it's confusing and scary for musicians to think that someone's really holding money for them. How do you guys deal with that, with artists refusing to collect their money? 
Well, it is funny, and I will say, you know, many years ago, uh, I think um, Sound Exchange was not as well known as we are today. Um, we do lots of things to increase uh, our exposure and make people realize that's a legit letter that they get. Uh, we have an entire um, outreach department that, that tries to socialize who we are among the industry. We go to many, many conferences. I think, um, you know, most of uh, we have a much better recognition now than we did, say, five or six years ago. Uh, and 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 once the money starts to flow, uh, you know these folks realize, oh, it's the real thing because what we administer and the money that we pay is becoming a very important part of the income stream out there uh, in the in the recording industry. If you look at the uh, the mid year numbers that were published about recording industry income in the U.S., Sound Exchange alone represents upwards of fifteen percent of the entire recorded industry income in the US. So we're becoming a very important part of, of the value chain and people are people are starting to, to notice more than they used to. Yeah, it's amazing because like when you're making music, there are so many people trying to not pay you for things that <laughs> when people are reaching out saying that they want to pay you, it's like it's hard to believe. Yeah, that's that well, um, thank you. It, um, it, I have to say that's um, uh, it's it's fun to be on those calls. I don't make many of them, but the people that do reach out and say, you know, we have money for you, and um, just just give us your, you know, all your tax information. It, it I can understand why at yeah. first, if you've never heard of Sound Exchange, that it, it would make people question. But um, we're getting a lot a lot of good acceptances now, and um, and many people are participating. As I said, we have over a hundred thousand accounts that we pay pay out to. Yeah, we love Sound Exch- Exchange. So thanks. Well, 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 excellent. Appreciate it. You guys also have on the front page of your website, don't you, a list of bands that still have not signed up, but who have whose money you are holding? We do. So we, we try to be as transparent as possible. Um, and the the way we get paid, uh, I don't want to don't want to bore you with the details, but uh, the Pandoras of the world and SiriusXM they use a license in federal law that allows them to stream every recording ever released, and th- for that reason, every month, Sound Exchange gets reported to it from over 2,500 services every recording ever streamed. So, whether it's Pandora, SiriusXM, or, or any of another 2,500 other services, we get data from them every month about every recording they use. And in that list are sometimes recordings of artists that we don't recognize or we haven't contacted. So when when some of that money builds up, we do put that on the website and encourage people to come and sign up. You know, it's free to register with Sound Exchange. It's free to become a member of Sound Exchange and participate even more actively in the things that we're doing to try to increase the value of music. So switching back to Daryl um, and the Respect Act, what do you think of the chances for that act in the new Republican Congress? Well, the wind is definitely at its back. With these Turtles lawsuits, um, there's a lot of attention given to pre-72. And of course, this is a very sympathetic audience. The very first um, witness we ever had testify on radio royalty issues was Sam Moore. You know, Sam, Sam is um, in his 70s now. He, of course, was part of Sam and Dave, Soul Man, so many great tracks. And the, the witness opposing him told Congress that by playing Sam and Dave's records, they're enabling Sam to go on tour. And Sam <laughs> turned to him and said, listen, I, I would like to be spending time with my grandchildren at this point in my life, not touring around <laughs> to earn money. So it's a, it's a very um, you know, important class of people that this protects. Uh, Michael can also speak to this as they've been a, a great champion and in, in, in forward thinker on the Respect Act. But um, co- you know, copyright is being looked at now in a very global context. The Judiciary Committee, which oversees this in the House, has uh, initiated a very comprehensive review of all copyright, not just music. So most likely, um, these issues will become part of something bigger as opposed to these the smaller issues. But we think with the, uh, the cases happening in state law and you know the attention given to this issue, that the pre-72 issue is one that certainly will be looked at very carefully by Congress. I was actually there on the Hill that year that Sam came. And I have to tell you, I've never seen anything like it. The Congress people were freaking out, um, you know, the ones who are old enough to remember his music. Do you have... <laughs> You guys, Daryl and Mike, uh, have you seen lots of things like that with with Congress people just getting really excited? Oh, with uh, oh yeah, the, there's um, there's a great synergy between members of Congress and musicians. I remember we had a meeting um, one time with Lyle Lovett and Senator Orrin Hatch, 
and these two people could not be more different, uh, as you can imagine. And um, Senator Hatch is also a songwriter, and he played uh, oh. one of his songs for um, Lyle. And Lyle oh, said, wow. "And Lyle said, you know, I really like that song, and I want to, I want to put a hold on it, which means the song, an artist says they want to have the right to record it." So we, at the end of the meeting, we were in the hallway, and I, I said to Lyle, "I said that was really nice of you to say, um, you know, that you want to put a hold on Senator Hatch's song." And and Lyle Lovett said, "No, I, I'm serious. I want to record that song. It was great." <laughs> so there's been a number of stories just like that where um, they really relate to each other, and they really, um, I think, respect each other. Oh, that's amazing, and, Mike. Do you have anything to add? Sure. You know, I've, we've had the same experience. Um, we work uh, hand in hand with the Recording Academy on, on a lot of these issues. And Daryl and I have, you know, done a lot together on the Hill. And um, we've had similar experiences where we take some of our members up. Um, I remember one one case where Martha Reeves, who's actually on our on our board, uh, the Sound Exchange board, we took her up um, to, to the Hill and, and took her on some visits. And, you know, there, there was one particular uh, congressman who will remain unnamed who, um, who insisted on doing, you know, the, 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 the trademark dance of, uh, of her band. Uh, and they really connect with the artists, as Daryl was saying, in a way that, you know, and, and it's for lots of reasons. One is it reminds them of their childhood. And, it, you know, music is special for all of us, right? It's not just when we talk about the Respect Act, when we talk about FM radio not paying artists, Yes, it's a financial issue for sure. Um, but more than that, it's a fairness issue and it's a cultural issue. You know, music is so much more than just part of the economy. It is part of who we are as a culture. It's part of what people remember growing up. It brings back memories, which just makes it all the more outrageous that these services are making as much money they are off the art of those artists and not paying them. You know, FM radio, uh, the music radio, music part of FM radio, makes 15 to 17 billion dollars a year billion 16 billion dollars a year off drawing a crowd with the recordings and they don't share a penny of that with the artists it's it's just a matter of simple fairness put aside all of the complicated copyright law and history and politics and turf wars it's a matter of simple fairness that seems like such a no-brainer but of course, the other side does have some sort of point that they're making, right? And and we were we tried to get a hold of Sirius and Pandora for this broadcast, and we could not get a hold of anyone to to give us their side of the story. So, can you guys at least tell us what are they saying on the Hill when they go to the Hill and talk to Congress? Well, sh- I mean, one of their big big arguments is well, it's it's promotional, and you should be thankful that we're playing your. Uh, recordings on FM radio because it's driving CD sales. Um, but the fact of the matter is CD sales are becoming a less and less important part. They're still important, but they're, they're becoming, um, you know, just part of a broad array of revenue streams that people need to uh, tap into in order to make a living. But really, Portia, even more than that, you know, p- whether it's promotional or not isn't the sole question. When uh, radio stations like the one that you'll be broadcasting this on, you know, when, when radio stations broadcast a local baseball game, it's absolutely true that they're helping to promote the baseball team uh, and help them sell merch and tickets. And nobody for a second would question that they have to license the rights for that baseball game. Or if I wrote a book, and Portia, you made a movie out of that book, uh, you know, I'm going to sell a million more books if that, if that movie is successful because people are going to see the movie and want to read my book. Your movie is promoting my book, but nobody for a second would expect me to give away the intellectual property in my book so you can make that movie because you're, quote, promoting me. In all other areas of industry and certainly intellectual property, people that create this art have a right to help control whether they think it's promotional and at what price they would give it away. I don't understand why music is different, and that type of promotion allows radio to take it without pay and make $15 billion a year off of it. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, even even the National Association of Broadcasters own argument that they and they did a study, a very biased study about the promotional effect. Even if you look at that, the promotional effect was just a minuscule part compared to the revenue that they make from music. And this really has nothing to do with the fact that CD sales are lowered or anything. This has been an issue for decades. It's just that music is is property, it should be compensated. There's no real argument on the other side and I think it's very obvious because none of them agreed to be on the show today that they don't have an argument. 
But they do have um, some political clout, and they've been using their um, political pressure to uh, influence Congress. That's changing now. Over the past couple of years, you've seen uh, that becoming less and less effective, and artists are speaking out more and more and becoming more powerful on Capitol Hill. And I see you've, you're seeing this trend very positively for our side now. That's Daryl Friedman. He's the head of governmental relations for the Recording Academy, and also Mike Huppy. He's the president of Sound Exchange. Daryl and Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Portia. Thank you. I'm Portia Sabin, and this is the future of what? Coming up, we're going to ask a really basic question. What does a record label do? We're going to ask Scott Robinson of Dual Tone Records. He runs the label that's home to awesome artists like the Lumineers, Shaky Graves, and Shovels and Rope. Stay with us. I'm Portia Sabin, and you're listening to The Future of What. It seems very basic, but a lot of people don't really know what record labels actually do. To answer this, we're talking to Scott Robinson. He's the head of Dual Tone Records, home of the Lumineers and other great bands. Hey, Scott, how are you? Hello, hello. So when I tell someone I run a record label, they invariably think I work at a recording studio. I think my mom is still trying to figure out what I do for a living. So what do you tell people when they ask you what you do? Well, in a nutshell, you know, our job is to promote, market, sell, monetize music. That can take a lot of different paths. It could look a lot of different ways, and um, but it's basically, in a nutshell, it's what we do. You have a great story about how things fell into place in your life that allowed you to start your own label. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting process. I started kind of late in life for the industry. You know, a lot of folks start young, kind of coming out of college or in college, and and uh, and in turn their way up uh, the process. I was uh, I came from uh, a finance background, working for uh, savings and loan industry, and um, it's funny. You know, you always hear the story of people having the midlife crisis in their forties. Well, I, or fifties. I had mine in my. 20s and uh, made a big career change, uh, and all my friends were artists at the time, and and uh, and started working with artists that I felt that that I felt like were very talented, but um, were lacking more on the business side. So you've worked at both major labels and now your own independent label. What are the big differences, in your opinion, between the two? You know, 
I think one of the big differences between indies and majors is that, you know, majors are great at what they do. Um, they might not be as financially responsible as maybe an independent label has to be because it's a, it's a small shop and usually, you know, individually owned or partners owned. So it's very bottom line driven. It's net income based versus, you know, top line market market share based. You know, and your risks are really risky, right? Yeah, the risks are really risky, but we try to minimize those risks. We're not in the business of, you know, playing the lottery here. We're dealing with art and art form. So, you know, granted, in today's landscape, it's so different out there. There's so many different revenue streams. It's not like it was when there was one or two primary revenue streams 15 years ago. So those of us who run labels really want our artists to be successful. And now that music is basically free, do you think that these other income streams we've been talking about today are enough to help your artists become career artists? Yeah, I think they are. I think, again, you know, you have to be very, you know, prudent and, and smart about the decisions you're making. You know, uh, you know, download sales are not gone. They're still very much a part of the overall equation. You know, physical pieces are, are vanishing very quickly. They're almost gone. But, yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunities in this new landscape that we all exist. Uh, I don't see downloads going away anytime soon. You know, streaming is, is increasing daily, if not hourly. Um, you know, as I like to say, we're kind of on this bridge right now, and the bridge is going from downloads to streaming. And I really believe that uh, once streaming scales, that it's going to be phenomenal. And I think it's going to be the largest consumption of music within the entertainment industry uh, from a historical standpoint as, as streaming grows because it's going to be so accessible uh, and on so many different devices in so many different places. I was an original Spotify denier. I was like, no, my catalog's not going on Spotify. But I have been completely amazed at how much money we've been making on Spotify. Uh, have you found that to be true for your label, too? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, I don't know if I say amazed, but I mean, I would say encouraged. Yeah, the numbers are there, and they're growing. So, Scott, tell us about one of your success stories, uh, like maybe the Lumineers, a band that you saw potential in and you put money behind, and what happened? Do you want the, the, the three-minute or, or the three-hour story? <laughs> the three-minute so would be great. great. <laughs> yeah, the three-minute would be great. It was one of those stories where it was almost a perfect uh, artist development story from the standpoint that as soon as we got involved, we started, the early signs started to develop. And, and one of the early signs was we had a sync in a, um, in a TV show and a season finale. And the record wasn't available. The single wasn't available online. All there was was footage from a house concert of them performing the song. And we saw the reaction from from that sync placement that was substantial, where people were, there was extremely large social media activity of folks talking about that song, talking about how to find that song. So we saw an early reaction of that um, just through social media platforms. And at that point, we were setting up radio, and, and the game plan was to, and it was one of those perfect storms where as touring started to build, radio started to build, sync started to build, and the everything followed in, in suit in, in the perfect storm where the press uh, was coming in, late night TV was locking in. And, and it was one of those things I remember looking back at it where, you know, the industry is really known, uh, which is sad to say, for, you know, perception is bigger than reality because everyone's hyping everyone else uh, across multiple platforms. I remember early on, this was a project where uh, reality was bigger than perception. Hmm. And we had to spend quite a bit of time and effort to educate on all fronts, if it was radio programmers, if it was music supervisors, and if it, if it was venue buyers, because there was times where you know the band would come to a market when they were just starting off playing to 50 people, but we knew the airplay that was happening and what was developing within the region of the market. We're like, look, this band's worth 3,000 tickets now, 2,000 tickets, 5,000 tickets. So it was really interesting where we had to educate everyone. And we had to educate radio, you know, what was 
how this was reacting at one format and how we thought it was going to react in another format. And, um, so it was one of those, it was really fun from that standpoint because it was more about telling the facts versus, you know, what we all experience a lot of the industry, which is a lot of hype. Wow. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's how it, how it rolled out. And, uh, and, to, and also, I mean, these artists, you know, the, the bandmates, I mean, they worked extremely hard. And it all started with a sync placement, which is so interesting because while you were talking, Scott, I was thinking about the fact that the thermals used to be famous for having turned down a fairly uh, lucrative sync spot um, for Hummer. Yeah, I think it gets a vet to all opportunities. You know, even, I mean, we do a lot of syncs here at Dual Tone and mainly a lot of TV and a few films a year and a few commercial spots a year. But is, you know, not every sync opportunity is, is you know, is a must-have. And, you know, you got to make sure it fits with with the act, with, you know, with uh, where the act is going and their philosophy. And, um, I mean, there's been, even on the Lumineers down to some developing acts here, you know, we've, we've had declined opportunities because it wasn't the right look or the right fit. So not every, not every sync is a, is a bullseye. But we found that to be a huge driver in an overall campaign, you know, over the last five to eight years, ten years, I mean, music is a big part of film and TV these days. And it is. It, it really has a subculture of people that are really into what has been synced or placed in, in shows. Yep, and it can be incredibly important to an artist's career. Yeah. So. Scott Robinson is the head of Dual Tone Records. He joined us by phone from his office in Nashville. Scott, thanks so much for coming on The Future of What. Thank you. Good talking with you guys. Coming up in a moment, we bring back Hutch Harris of The Thermals to ask him a few questions. Right here on The Future of What from Kill Rockstars and X-Ray FM. back on the future of what i'm portia saban this show is about the music business this is our first episode and we've been talking about how artists make money in a marketplace where music is largely free we began with hutch harris of the thermals and we're going to end today with him saving the best for last always (laughs) hutch welcome back thanks portia i want to ask you about touring okay when i talk to you a new band i they always say they're going to go on tour Uh and then they either do go on tour and hate it and break up yeah or sometimes, every now and then, they go on tour and they love it. Yes. So or you... they love it at first and then they hate it very right. soon after. So can you tell us about your, like, so you went on that first tour so, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, Kathy Foster, who plays with me in the Thermals, we had a couple bands before the Thermals. Um, and we had already done a lot of touring. And we did like it. And it is hard. Uh, I mean, whether or not, you know, if you love it or hate it, it is just something you have to do. Uh, if you want to be a successful band. But yeah, it does drive a lot of people crazy. But, um, you know, once 
once the thermals got signed and we really had to like really start touring like most of the year, we had already done uh, enough tours that we were we were kind of ready for that. And uh, we had kind of done so many hard, we had done, done so many tours with no label support, with no agent, you know, we're booking ourselves that by the time, you know, once we were signed and started touring, you know, it, it got easy, uh, it got easier in some ways, uh, you know, because we had done such hard tours before that. Can you tell us about some of those hard tours? Like what, what makes touring hard? Okay, when, yeah, when bands that are starting out now complain about touring. I have to explain to them, and I sound old because I am. But so Kathy and I, you know, the first tour we did uh, was probably 1995 or 96. So we had no cell phone. We had no GPS. Uh, you know, and like I said, we had no agent. We had no label. Uh, we didn't even have email. So what we would, you know, you're just calling uh, when you when you're booking the tour yourself, you're just calling people. It takes forever because you're missing people a lot. You're leaving messages, you know, for weeks. Uh, then when you finally hear back from someone, they don't want to do a show for you. Uh, you know, you know, you get in the van and you just have like some handwritten. You know, you've talked to the promoter on the phone and you just have handwritten directions that are you know usually not totally correct. So when you roll into a city, then you have to go find a payphone to call the promoter and hope they're around so you can get exactly to the you know club. I mean, I just remember even just when like you had MapQuest and you would you know still before GPS, you know you'd print out you know directions that would also be wrong, often. <laughs> right. So now today, when you think you have a cell phone, you have a smartphone, you know you have GPS. It's so incredibly, it's so much easier than it used to be, uh, you know, which is great for us. You know, it's it's so much less stressful than it used to be. But I mean, still touring is stressful. But you do have to when when new bands complain about touring, you got to be the old man and tell them when you know back in my day, like you really don't know how easy it is now. Absolutely, yeah. and it helped that you and Kathy had been friends for a while, Definitely. so that you guys got along. Yeah, because I have been on tours where I wasn't speaking to my guitar player oh, or yeah. my bass player, and I I would speak to my bass player and tell my bass player to tell my guitarist something. Oh God, yeah, it was really and stories juvenile. like that are common, mm -hmm. and. I mean, another thing I tell bands is when you're starting a band with someone, the priority uh, is that you get along first <laughs> and then can you play together. Right. If you, you know, if you're in a band with someone you don't like, I wouldn't say that band's not going to last because these bands do last and bands just hate each other for Forever. their entire lives. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, if you really want to enjoy being in a band, you know, people think the priority is, well, let's find someone who can play and can we play together. No, it's like, can we be friends first and then can we be a band second? Right. So do you guys have any, I know that I have some tour stories that are, you know, like two or three margarita tour stories like where you're not going to actually hear it until we're like pretty wasted because they're <laughs> I think that like most terrible. most of our stories are like that. <laughs> do you have any that we can, we can have over like morning coffee? Any, any good ones that can be shared? I mean, I think uh, as to, for what we're talking about, I remember one time just on one of our first tours, uh, we were going to Detroit. Uh, we had terrible directions. You know, we pulled into the city. Uh, you know, we're like driving around, uh, you know, forever looking for a payphone. Finally find a payphone. Uh, promoters not answering. Driving around even longer, you know, trying to find the club. We never found the club. And and this is, you know, this is like almost, this is almost 20 years ago. So this was not, a, you know, this is not a fun time to be driving around Detroit. Right. You know, aimlessly, you know, not aimlessly, but trying to find the damn club. Eventually, uh, you know, we just left the city. Right. We never found the show. We just turned around and left. <laughs> never knew what happened, never heard, you know, never heard back from the promoter. There was no way, wow. maybe, you know, he called us at home, but, you know, we never knew. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so yeah. it was a huge missed opportunity for us. I managed a band one time who we booked a tour. I mean, I booked the tour. It was, uh -huh. it was the same deal. And they showed up, and the venue had exploded the night before, and there was a oh, hole in the ground. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> you might be that's relieved happened. at that point. I know. You're like, like, oh, thank God, we can right, just go home. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so... In addition to GPS, has anything else changed that's made you more comfortable on the road, or is it just literally just getting used to it and knowing what you're doing? 
you know, it's nice if you can, you know, there's uh, companies like Bandigo that rent sprinters uh, to bands or there, you know, there's more than one company like that, that will, uh, you know, if you, if your band can't afford a van to buy a van, but you can afford to rent one from your tour, you know, uh, and you can rent a sprinter and, you know, they put like an Xbox and, and there's like captain's chairs in it. It's a lot more comfortable than like a broken down, like 85, you know, Chevy van, which is what we used to tour in. Right. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot more, uh, like facilities there's a lot more options for bands like that and i mean really just having the internet there's just you know i mean obviously the internet has changed everything and not always for the better Mm -hmm. but it's definitely such a good resource for bands you know to you know to talk to other bands and to you know to i can't like stress it hard enough imagine trying to book your own tour without email or without the internet it's insane yeah so it's made it uh, so much easier, I think. We lost the twenty-year-olds at payphones. You know that, right? We oh yeah, no yeah, idea yeah. what no we're talking idea. about. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <I> no. <laughs> well, Hutch Harris is the lead singer and guitar player of the Thermals. He joined us here in studio. Hutch, thank you so much for coming on. Oh yeah, thanks for having me. I'm not looking to find a pot of gold. I will paint you a picture that's inside my head. First, I must carve out a place. Picture yourself carving out a place in a room. Now look up, there's the diamond ceiling. Look up now, this is what it sounds like. Around you is a solitude trilogy. And that's all for this first episode of The Future of What, the show focusing on the business of music. Special thanks today to the studios of OPB. This show was engineered by Stephen Cray. The Future of What is produced by Jimbo Sandberg and John Sepulvado of X-Ray FM and me, Portia Sabin, president of Kill Rock Stars. If you missed any part of today's show, you can find the whole thing at xray.fm or at killrockstars.com. Thanks for listening. So you sit down and you start to think of ideas of the North. But in walk the latecomers. They back shuffle forwards. Their sound is weird. I am not looking to find a pot of gold. The picture in my head is my reward. Go. Around you is a solitude trilogy, and glass slippers are on your feet. When I say go, you'll hear the solitude trilogy come in clearly. Go. Now look down, the glass slippers are on your feet. This is what they sound like as they meet. Now walk in the self-eaters, their sound is much clearer, here. So you sit down and you start to think of ideas of the North. But in walk the latecomers. They back shuffle forwards. Their sound is weird. Yeah.